I've lost you. I, I'm here. Okay. 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 Um, hello. I want to welcome everybody who is here online with me and uh, people who might come in um, later on or hear the recording. I'm Robin Long, and I don't know how much Juanita um, said about me, but basically I'm here, if you look at the presentation uh, description, to present a project called Kids of Field, and I want to go over some nuts and bolts up front so you know where we're headed. Uh, firstly, I'd like to introduce you to the team that put together has been working on this project. Uh, it's two elementary teachers that you can see on your slide, Marilyn Fenster and Gail Hans. Between the two of them, they like to say they have probably 50 years of experience as elementary teachers. I am uh, have contributed as the science person and the tech person. And I probably could say, if you want to count the years that I used to help my mother in her, her classroom, that I have another 50 years of education. So between the three of us, we kind of are 100, 100 years of teaching. Um, we all work. I am no longer working there, but at the Harley School, that you can see the picture at the top, it's an independent school. And through 12, about 500 students, it's located in Rochester, New York, which is in upstate New York. Everything that is not um, in New York City is called upstate. We're close to Lake Ontario. So I want to thank the school for supporting this program that we've been doing, and um, also the head of the lower school division that you can see in the picture down there. So those are the thank yous to my teammates who cannot be here to share with me, uh, but I will push forward. One thing I'd like to say, as we go along, please, any questions that come up, I have slides, they're in an order, but what makes a conference uh, the most interesting is when people, we can address things as they come out. I do have, uh, in general, I'm going to give a little background on what Kids of Field is, why it came to be, then the nuts and bolts of how to do this program. And to, for all of us involved in it, the most interesting part is the learning that we have seen, not only the children's learning, but our own learning. At the end, um, there will be resources and some extensions of other sorts of things you could do. But before we do that, just so I have, get a little bit of a feel for the people who are here. If people would take part in the poll, if you go up to the, the poll part of your bar there, and you could, so I know, um, I put ages of students rather than classes because I, I know that um, it varies. Uh, what we call first grade might be different in a different country. Hello, Diane and Renee. If you go up to where it says participants, you'll find a little square box that says participants. And in that participants list there, there's a little drop down menu that has A, B, C, or D. If you'd like to just click on the number that you've clicked on there, we'll be able to show that poll on the whiteboard. Okay. Great, thank you. I noticed that a lot of people are, are teaching students uh, somewhat older than the Kids of Field program is. Those are actually my own experience. The 24 years that I was a classroom teacher was with middle school students. And I will go on to give the rationale as to why we started this program with very young kids. But most of what we have done is applicable to older students. Um, but I'd still like to give the background on why we set it up to work with very young children. And at the end, I actually do have some slides and some information about working with older, older students. So there's just two more quick um, polls, if you could take. One is uh, simply, if you're familiar with the VoiceThread tool, 
uh, if you use it or you're totally unfamiliar. Even if everybody here is familiar, because I understand um, from myself, I'm a big podcast listener to presentations, that um, I will go over it a bit, but it's helpful that I know. Um, oh, great. So, so you have a pro account. So no, I see that people are writing that they're familiar with it. Well, that's good because that will make it somewhat easier. But as I said, I'll probably talk about it a little bit. And we do have some people who haven't used it at all. Final is if you're familiar with the archiving tool Storyfy, Storify, uh, everything that I present here, everything I make a reference to, is can be found at the Storify site that I will share a link with. Um, it's, it's on the slides at the end. So if you just take a minute or two, and if you're not familiar with it, it's real easy to use. Okay, so we've got a, uh, a split there. All right, well, basically, going back to the, the main menu, I'm just going to jump forward. And as I said, if you have questions, raise your hand. Uh, you'll find the little hand if you're, this is the first time you've been to this kind of a site at the top. And uh, we will notice, and um, I will address that. Um, what Kids Afield is, was an effort made to connect small children with nature through cameras by using uh, digital cameras. So there, these are, by the way, are all pictures that the students have taken. The rationale behind what we did um, really stemmed from the fact that after being in a classroom uh, at this particular school for 25 years and realizing that I was 66, that if I wanted to do something on a bigger in a bigger way than I was just as a classroom teacher, it was time to step out and do it. My school, the Harley School, was engaged in an initiative at the time uh, due to a new building that we put up that involved sustainability and civic engagement along with mindfulness. I uh, applied and was hired as a contract worker for one year after I left the classroom. And basically, I made myself available to teachers who had ideas of things they might want to do uh, in the area of where I had the experience, which was related to um, uh, environmental science. Now, as a middle school teacher, which is what I was basically, I had also spent a fair amount of time doing video work with, with students. And also, I had a, a film, a nature We have lost your audio. I've lost your audio this end. Um, would you like to just see how you go again, please? Okay. So, where shall I backtrack Look to? Back. All the way back? Here we go. Yes, just a, a, not too far back, just a couple of minutes. Oh, okay. Basically, how I got involved with this project with the other two teachers was I took on a position of being a contract worker after being in a classroom for 25 years. I really realized that, well, I've been in, in teaching for longer than that, but I've been at this particular school that long, that um, I was 65 and life was going to run out on me before I had a chance to do some other things if I didn't take advantage of the situation I was in. Our school had several initiatives going on, and so I stepped out to be a contract worker. I asked, my job was to um, offer environmental uh, projects and ideas for teachers who might want to be interested along with the initiative that the school was undertaking involving sustainability and a huge green building we had put up. The teachers who came forth right away were uh, Gail and Marilyn, who teach a looped first grade kindergarten class, meaning they have the students for two years. They had already been engaged at different times in their career with having the kids work on a project they called My Backyard, which is really my school backyard. So they said, we got together in the summer before the school year started, what could we do that would really 
be unusual, that would engage kids. They were looking for ideas. Now, simultaneously, I had been doing um, a fair amount of work along with my environmental work with design thinking. Um, I don't know uh, how many people are aware of design thinking. I do have, um, it's kind of a big thing right now. Stanford University's D School, it's a problem solving. Uh, format that really can be applied to any any topic or area. And Stanford University has made, uh, they took on a K-12 initiative and have made all of their materials available. And they are really useful. This is tangential to what I'm going to talk about, but I just want to throw it out as a resource. I do have the link to it in Storify. Um, but the problem solving, one thing that differentiates design thinking problem solving is that you start with empathy. And in reading our materials, one of their suggested things was to use a camera to build empathy. And it works in two ways. For one thing, the person taking the picture, what you're seeing is their view, what they want, what's important to them. So you get a sense of connecting with how somebody else is seeing the world. So if you take and apply this to what your students focus on when you give them a project, you're getting a, a, a very, you're getting a snapshot, an unusual snapshot. Additionally, if you are the person taking the picture, you are selecting a very limited space, and there's reasons for that. So the idea of using cameras excited me. Meanwhile, I had spent the year, uh, the school is interested in doing citizen science projects uh, with the students. Uh, there are many of these. I'm, I, uh, don't know, you can raise your hand if you're familiar or want me to go on and on about citizen science. But a good example is the bird counts that a lot of organizations run where citizens can, uh, on a specific date, can look at birds that come to their bird feeders. In thinking about working with little kids, I decided that really what they, we want to do is have them be citizen naturalists. Now, none of these ideas are original or just mine, but as I developed the ideas and shared it with the teachers, they thought this was a great idea. So um, we decided to go ahead with it. Meanwhile, after the fact, I went out and started to do research in the area and uh, came up with reasons that other people have done this and other environmental educators and why they think it's important. Um, they were really basically the same reasons that we had decided upon, and it's always uh, nice when you start a new project and think you, you know, your ideas. It's nice to see that other people who are out there, more public, more well known, are agreeing with what you're doing. There is an um, environmental photographer named David Fitzsimmons, and I have a link to his um, this article. But basically, just a bullet, you can see what's up there. It's the limiting the field of focus that I talked about. It's also archiving the experience, which is where VoiceThread comes in. And then there's hybrid thinking, which I will talk a little bit more about. Um, but the biggest thing for us, and it was the first thing we hit upon, is everybody knows children, and not just little kids, but kids at well, I have, to, I have to clarify that. Little kids, for sure, you take them outside and they, they love being outdoors. Now, by the time they're in middle school, if they haven't had those positive outdoor experiences, a lot of them don't, aren't, don't connect with the outdoors. As a matter of fact, they develop an antagonistic um, relationship to it. I've worked with students like this. Uh, this past fall, I was working with students, and a lot of them are minority students who live in environments where the outdoors is very unuser friendly, um, and they connect it with dirt and so forth. And I was working with them, and I was doing a geology thing actually. But I said, "Oh, we're going to go and um, dig up, dig in the ground." And they were horrified until I explained to them that they got shovels. So they really have made this negative connection. Now it's it's this reason that we decided we wanted to develop a program that would work with very young kids that could be easily exported to other schools. Because a lot of research does show that most people who really enjoy being outdoors made a strong connection when they were young 
um, having been given the opportunity to play in the outdoors, and also in conjunction with an adult uh, uh, who had some relationship, because the adult was the one who modeled the value of the outdoors, and more important than that, took their play in the outdoors seriously. So we knew that our kids were going to be highly motivated to be outdoors. We also knew that they would really be motivated by the cameras because it's technology, and they all love technology. Uh, just to jump a little bit on hybrid thinking, uh, a little bit of research. Hybrid thinking is, is thrown around a lot now. Um, I see that somebody mentioned that most adults don't trust kids with cameras, and that is sad, and that's definitely true. When I go to the hi, I mean how we did this, I will address that. But hybrid thinking is exactly what I was talking about. I'm sure any of you are involved in environmental work at all. You probably know the work of Richard uh, Love, who is very well known for his book, uh, The Last Child in the, um, the Last Child in the Woods and um, Nature Principles. And he is very big on using what he calls hybrid thinking, which is connecting technology and the outdoors. I think this is um, a really true thing. Um, everybody loves the outdoors, but as kids get older and older, you take a lot of them outdoors. What am I going to do there? You give them a camera, and it gives them, you know, it's not, it's not their iPad. It's not their listening to music. They're using the camera in the service of finding out more about the outdoors. I also um, recently uh, realized that E.O. Wilson, uh, the ant biologist, um, recently has written a book called uh, Advice to Young Scientists. And he really feels that um, the best scientists, and he's been at I know, Harvard for 24 years or 40 years, are not the brightest people, but they're the people who bring the mind of a poet and but can also work like a bookkeeper. And in that sense, the camera, even while we're taking it outdoors and there are a million science-related things we can do, but it also has that poetic side to it. And uh, then being the bookkeeper is, if you're going to look at the slides uh, from the viewpoint of a science kind of background, um, and here's somebody else who's making a similar statement about the importance of hybrid thinking. So kind of enough on hybrid thinking. Part of the reason I'm going through these whys is if you are going to your school and you say, boy, I'd like a little bit of money to get cameras for kids, one, it's good to have, to realize there are a lot of other people out there besides myself uh, sharing these ideas. But it's also true that I don't know uh, in the United States, at any rate right now, schools are really, really struggling with getting funding for projects like this because everything has come down to passing tests and how many times a student raises their hand and all sorts of other things. Okay, so I want to throw out um, just three resources along the way that have been helpful in framing our ideas. One, of course, is Richard. Lube, and he has a children and nature network that has a lot of materials and ideas. Um, there is also an organization called the North American Association for Environmental Education. And we presented our Kids of Field project there last fall. And I believe, actually, there were some people there from Australia, though it is North American. But they invite people from all over. Interestingly, environmental educators, and these for the most part were not, this conference was really not so much people involved in schools with kids, it was much more um, college educators or people at nature centers. But they had realized that environmentalists, even though all the evidence says we want to connect kids when they're young, that they're, it's really been ignored by a lot of environmental educators. And so they have a new, a new um, they funded a new project called Natural Start. The link to that is on my Storify um, archive. And Natural Start is a great resource for, it is particularly for younger children. Yeah, I agree. So I just see over here somebody has mentioned that with older kids, cameras can be the positive key. And that's definitely true. Um, finally, I will talk a little bit about the Cornell Lab of Ornithology at a certain point, because they are a wonderful resource uh, for all the materials that they provide related to birds. 
Okay. So, in terms of kids and cameras, little kids and trusting them, one thing we did was we invested in kid cameras. Kid cameras are um, reasonably cheap, $30, $35 U.S. dollars, um, and they are pretty indestructible. And when you have parents worried about kids using cameras, this is a good pitch because these I've watched these cameras be dropped. Um, Actually, we had one drop in the creek, and we pulled it out, pulled out the batteries, uh, dried it out, and it worked. And they're easy to use. There are um, two, um, yeah, they are really cheap. Now, there's a downside, and that's that they require batteries, and that's also not very um, environmental. But here's a, here's a little clue that I suggest people go and look at. I knew nothing about this, but um, apparently a, a surgeon at our school told us that in most operating theaters, there are a lot of little tools that are used and they require AA batteries, which is what these cameras take. They take four of them. And I guess in a theater or in a surgery situation, even in a test situation, once the tool has been turned on and used once, the batteries have to be replaced just for safety reasons. And so this doctor had accumulated a huge box of batteries and donated them to the school. Um, so that's that's been a wonderful way to get a pretty much rust free batteries and you're also recycling them. Um, there are also um, rechargeable batteries, but that is the downside. I will also say um, potentially a downside. These cameras, just because everything today has a million bells and whistles, they do have um, uh, other little, um, uh, they take video, you can put mustaches on things. Um, and so kids are going to discover that. And that has to do with how we introduced it. We didn't want to put that down, but I'll talk about that because, and I did this actually when I worked with my older kids too. We didn't do it. Um, the teachers I was working with use a program called Responsive Classroom, where you spend the first three weeks of the school year having kids come up with the rules that are going to set, so it's really about agency. What are rules that are going to care for each other, care for the space, and so forth? So one thing they did was to uh, introduce the camera the way they introduce whenever they bring in new objects, and they bring them, they share it in the room, and um, they take a lot of time explaining how it is a tool, and we did stress that with the kids. This is a tool. It's a tool used by artists. It's a tool used by scientists. It's a tool used by um, anybody um, uh, who, well, I don't know. You can come up with a million ways it's a tool. And like any tool, there's a right and wrong way to use it. Now, we stressed that we were really going to be using it as a tool to look at the outdoors, and we spent a lot of time with them talking about man-made versus not man-made things. Uh, I'll show you uh, a little slide up here. Uh, this I did with older kids because we were talking. They were part of my nature club. And I, we had this dialogue with our younger kids, um, but not with these pictures. And of course, the, you know, pictures are a story, and we organize our thinking, you know, Human beings, we like stories. That's how we share it. That's our culture. That's our learning. So they were very quick um, to see, even my middle schoolers, that you change how much you change the story. When you put people in it, what you're looking at is the people, which is fine if that's what you want to do. But if what you're really trying to look at is the outdoors, then you don't want to be taking pictures of people. So uh, that worked very well with our kids. And they quickly understood that, yes, there are other things these cameras do, but that's not what we're going to do. I think I told them that, um, you know, when winter comes, during your free time, ask the teachers if you can play around with the mustaches and stuff. Anyway, it was not a problem, but we talked about it up front. And that they feel, you know, for them, the camera is seen as a valuable tool. Most of them don't have cameras, and most of the cameras taking pictures around them are on cell phones, and most of them don't have cell phones. Um, the other thing that I wanted to uh, explain when we did it, um, in terms of going ahead with kids afield, 
was that we really let the kids be the agents of what we were going to do. You know, how are we going to study the outdoors? What are you interested in? Where do you want to go? And the choices they made were probably uh, where some of the greatest learning occurred for us. Uh, they really made birds the class focus. And um, that came about because our school was doing a um, oh, some sort of environmental, the upper school was doing some sort of project with birds. And our kids were part of that. And so I think somebody suggested, where are good places for birds? And they started taking pictures of one time when we were outside of what would be a good place for a bird, would birds like this, you know. And, and then you're looking at bird nests and bird feeding. Yes, a question. Uh, we have a question there, and that was, um, Someone wanted to know, it was Gail Lovely wanted to know why you use children's cameras rather than adult cameras. Okay, good. Well, for one thing, these are kids who are five and six years old. Um, and, you know, they're, they're indestructible. Um, they, and they're also very cheap. You know, we managed to get, uh, we had a, we have an annual fundraiser, and so we had parents get, um, you know, people purchased for us um, 30, uh, I don't know, 10 cameras pretty quickly. And then based on the work we've done, the school didn't mind funding um, more of them. But they really, they fit their hands. And they love them. And they don't feel there at all. I mean, I think it's a little bit like what Montessori discovered. You know, she was the one who brought kid-sized stuff into the kid environment. Um, as kids get older, they'll be very quick to tell you, oh, I don't want to play with that camera. It's a baby camera. But they didn't feel that way about it. So uh, that was the choice we made. Um, let's, and, and they are very easy to use. You know, the on-off buttons, they quickly show each other. And so it was not a frustrating experience for them. Um, and there are actually plenty of adult tools they're using, which one of which is in some ways is voice thread. Uh, before we leave this slide, I, I want to talk about valuing students' interest. And this had to do with our learning. So if you just keep in mind this odd little slide down here that looks like a miniature candy store, which I think it is, with a mouse. Because that became one of the biggest learning for us as environmental teachers. So OK, learning. Um, we did a number of things just to see the effect of what we were doing outside was having on, you know, these are kids who are in the pre-reading and writing stage. So we did do some authentic assessment. Um, on one of these pictures, I think I printed out a bunch of the slides. And then students sat down to pick one of the pictures and explain why they thought, why they had taken that picture, and, or why they liked the picture, why they didn't like the picture. And uh, there's so much learning that goes on here. And I found this actually with my middle school students, because we would share slides, which I'll show you at the end, a little bit differently. But um, it, they, um, so it, it, was, it was a lot of learning. Well, it was a way for us to measure learning, if you want to say, well, what did they learn by you know, taking this time? Oh, one thing I want to say about this project, because um, I know classrooms now are very, very, very busy. I only meet with this class for 40 minutes once a week. So all this is just going on once a week. And uh, so therefore, one doesn't need to have huge amounts of time. OK, well, this another uh, question. Uh, Robin, how do you manage all of the transfer of photos and the storing of them for the students? OK, great question. And I'll tell you. This is one reason this project came to be, because when I left the classroom, I had the time to do it. These teachers never could have done it. So I do think that even if you're only doing it once a week, um, if, you know, what I would do, what I would suggest in a situation like this would be, now if you're working with middle school kids, they can do the transferring. But if you're working with very small children, then what you're going to need to do is to go to, I don't know, many schools now have service projects or kids during study hall. I would go to, you know, a fifth or sixth grade child could do it. 
Um, and that was part of it. When we worked with the kids, we had to explain to them, you know, we're asking you to take two pictures today or four pictures today. And I would tell them, you know, I was the one um, who was going to have to do the transferring. And I said, I just, I can't physically transfer all your pictures. But it's one of those situations where putting a limit on it, it's like, you know, when you write grants and you don't have to describe something in 100 words, it's a pain in the neck, but in the end, it really becomes very worthwhile. So that's what I would suggest would be that you go, um, you know, and, and seek help with, with students. So, well, I just, I know time's running out. This is going quickly, but I wanted to explain the bird connection. The kids made this connection and it really taught us something. And later on, I talked to somebody who's currently getting his PhD in environmental education that before we did the birds, they won't be outdoors. But they were kind of all over the place. But suddenly when they made the connection with birds, it, it just it made it all more meaningful to them in a way that just totally surprised us. And then we came to appreciate the fact birds are wonderful. They're present all year. The global connection because of migration is fantastic. And you can obviously do things with birds and art, music, and writing. And you can see them. All the kids have experience with birds. And that's when I also want to explain that Cornell Lab of Ornithology has dynamite online materials. A lot of the materials you do pay something for, but they also just have wonderful bird sounds, bird, all of that kind of stuff is free um, on their site. So they're definitely, if you want to do anything outdoors. Oh, the other thing with birds is that it lent itself very quickly to inquiry learning. Kids would wonder about bird nest, or actually, you know, and uh, later on they did a little, little experiment. Then they used their cameras as data collecting, because they took pictures, they put red and brown yarn out and made predictions as to which ones they would take for nest. And then this led to, well, do birds see color? And all of this kind of um, questioning that went on. Okay, let's see. Um, okay, now this was the learning that we learned the most. <laughs> We were outside with our, our uh, kids. Uh, this is the class year before, last, not this spring, but spring before. And we were in the woods. You can see they all have their little cameras. And um, they suddenly said, we found a mouse town. We had no idea what they were talking about. And all of them came over, and they took a picture of the hole there and up in the tree, and they just were beside themselves with mouse town. Well, it turned out that we have, um, actually, he's a, uh, um, a, a very well-known U.S. Uh, storyteller, Jay Stetzer, but he, he works at our school. And it turns out that he had had this experience with a mouse that somebody had found, and he wanted the kids to understand that the mouse was his own person. So he developed this very elaborate story about how he met this mouse, and the mouse had a little camera, and the mouse went un underground and took all these pictures, and he made like a 30 a uh, 30 slide PowerPoint of all the places that were Mouse Town. And the kids talked about, oh, we could see the light and, and on and on. The thing that was so neat about this was, you know, as an environmental educator, and especially in today's world where one of the common core things that's coming out is we need kids to do more nonfiction, it was so natural and so real for them. Um, there is actually a wonderful article that I do have a link for in oh, um, Ryan Magazine, which is an environmental magazine by David Sobel, who said, we are missing it with the environment. Kids up through grade six, they don't need to know all the scientific this and the scientific that. You need to make them love the outdoors. And John Burroughs, interestingly, um, who is an 1800s environmentalist, they found this quote. He said, knowledge without love will not stick, but if love comes first, knowledge is sure to follow. Now, not every kid, you know, is going to want to, because they love the outdoors, want to become a, a Darwin or a E.O. Wilson. But at least they will care about it and appreciate it and hopefully vote environmentally on behalf of it. So it was so neat that, um, and this is where, you know, we were learning so much from working with the kids in this environment. Um, you know, do they really think there's a, well, you know, they're at that stage where abstract thinking is just starting to develop, but um, they valued the fact that we took it seriously. So that was great. Um, okay, so it looks like a lot of people have experience with VoiceThread. 
Um, VoiceThread is, as this says, it's everything. Um, I will, it's how we elected. In terms of sharing, we decided that some of the greatest learning would come about by sharing um, the pictures. Because that's one thing that photos do. You can bring them inside. You can look at things. The kind of discussions you can have. Um, the kids will read them themselves. Or, you know, when you can have a discussion about, if I ask you to go draw water, what color will you make it? Blue. Everybody makes water blue. And then we look at all the pictures. Does water ever look blue? You know, you just opened up so many doors to questions. Well, VoiceThread, um, and so for people who know this, I'm sorry, but I'm still, I'll go through it quickly. VoiceThread is a wonderful tool, and in a moment I will just share with you a, a little bit of VoiceThread if I get all the technology to work right. Um, we have kids work in teams of two. If you only had one camera, you know, you could still work it out. You could go out and have, I think two's worked out well because they kind of bounce off each other. Sometimes one person might say, you know, you hold this down for me or do this and that, or a student might forget how to do close-ups or whatever. So they also worked at twos. I did put the slides into that. They each had a slide account on VoiceThread. Um, and they worked in twos on VoiceThread, and these are the teams. We um, did this at a computer lab. You could do it if you had a workstation in your classroom and do it that way. But um, this worked out well for us. And I'll show you. This is what a VoiceThread looks like. When you open up a VoiceThread account, you will see the pictures. And if you click this, you could put endless numbers of photos. So you build a whole archive of the year's um, photos over there. And you can, somebody's pointing out, you can put videos on here. Um, but the neat thing about it, additionally, is if you click on this, you go to a box, and you can put in your own name. Then you can comment, or which can be questions or comments about what you see, on whatever is on that screen. And you could end up with 50 people around the outside. Now, we didn't do that, but you can. And the other neat thing about it is that you can both type it in, or you can use the mic. And I actually believe you can do it by phone. Um, I've never done that. But it is um, a really wonderful site. And the kids put up their slides, and then they would pick out a couple to talk about. We only went in the computer lab maybe once or twice a month. Um, this is another use we made a voice thread. This was a case where uh, a teacher, uh, it was an inquiry experiment they had done as a result of their camera work. And it was a class discussion, and the teacher typed it up, and I put it into a voice thread for them so that they had it. And also, a voice thread is a great thing. Oh, another thing about it, you can make it open to the world. So this is where I think you could get into fantastic things with another school. You know, go out, take the same pictures on the same day. Take pictures of a bird. Take pictures of the ground. You just think about the global kinds of sharing you can easily do with VoiceThread. But you can also make it totally private. And you can make it so that somebody um, um, can only have it with the link so it's for parents. What I'll try to do is, whoops, another question. Nope. I, I think what I'll do is try to show you, I should have had back here a little voice sort of the kids talking. OK. OK. Now, this is. Their actual voice thread. Oh, no, I'll close that. Uh, let's see. Okay, let's see. Uh, Robin, I believe um, if you try it in a web tour, so if you put the link into, come back to the room and put it in the web tour, people may be able to hear that. They can't hear it during an app share. No. Oh, oh they can't hear it during the app share. So if you try the web tour, so just oh, put the oh, link okay, into the web okay. tour. So. Okay, I'm sorry. I Okay, that's okay. I, I will go back to the other, other I'll, I'll shut it down then. I'm sorry. Um, 
Well, anyway, um, I, I hope you get the idea of it, is that, and you think about the kind of thinking. Our kids learn so much, and actually, you know, it's, um, middle school kids can do the same kind of thing. Um, they're having to describe it. Most, and our, our little kids, and I know my older kids will do the same thing, they'll say, oh, I like this picture because it's cool or it's neat. And so it really pushes them, but in a way that then they come to value. So voice thread is just a wonderful, wonderful tool. Um, I don't think there's time to add the link now, but I, um, oh, the other thing I'll tell you about voice thread, it's not free. Um, if you get an individual account, it's $80 for the year, which will give you enough for 50 students and endless amount of material you can put on. If your school goes on board, then it can become cheaper. You can get site licenses that are cheaper than that. But for $80, um, it's, it's great. Uh, and this is another example of something um, that uh, we use VoiceThread to archive some of the work kids were doing in class showing the connection between their outdoor and indoor work. Um, I wanted to share just a few of the kids' pictures, and then I'll end with a few of the little school pictures. Uh, this is, uh, you know, this is a picture they took, and you just sit around talking. So many questions can come up. Uh, you know, what are all of these things? Well, they're vines. Uh, you know, I wouldn't bring this into my little kids, but the truth of the matter is, environmentally, vines and forest have always been at war, and environmentally, now a lot of places, the vines are winning. There's so many questions there. You know, why is the snow not down to here? Um, it's really endless what you can do with picture. And these are their pictures. Oh, this is a Storify site that's on the end of this presentation. I don't think this is going to link here, but if you copy and paste it or take the time to write it down, everything that I've shared on here can be found at Storify. And when you get to it, you'll, if you don't know Storify, it's a really nice archiving site because, among other things, it, um, it gives you more than just like a digo, just the address. It gives you a little blurb about each thing. So, uh, and then also, um, this is my Gmail. I think I put another, either one. I have either email. I have, I have two on this site, and that's my uh, Twitter. And this is the Connect Children to Nature um, wiki spaces that I have that provides um, a lot of background history, including some videos of work we've done. Okay, I see this site is almost over time-wise, but I just wanted to share. There are so many extensions of things you can do with cameras. You know, it's tracking changes over time. And again, you throw out ideas, the kids start to come up with their own ideas. Um, I'm not going to read all these things, uh, but I will say that data inquiry things, which need a lot. One, it's great basic, you know, down in the dirt science is looking at uh, even, you know, counting leaves with your camera pictures. There's so many things you can do. And if you're on a school ground that's all blacktop, there's still nature. You know, that can be a great, a great um, thing to do with kids. Take them outside. What is here that would be here even if there were no people. Um, and then there's some, a lot of fun things you can do, like a photo scavenger hunt, where rather than having kids go out and find the objects, they find pictures of the objects. Uh, it can be great story starters, poetry starters, and kids could come up with their own games and activities. So uh, this was, these are the threads that they put out and took pictures of, and then they went back to see them, and there were a lot of discussions about, um, you know, did birds take them away, did people take them away, and so forth. Um, and these are just some, one day I want to show you these and then show you some of the older kids' photography. One thing that jumped out at us is that some kids have a real eye at a very young age for, you know, what they're taking pictures of. Uh, sometimes their focus isn't so great. We talk about things like that a little bit, but we don't really dwell on that. They're pretty quick to understand when, you know, they can see the difference between this and that, and doing a close-up is difficult. But I'm sure this child picked this because it was a three-leaf clover. Um, here again, actually with slightly older kids, we had a big discussion. You know, here's something that runs into our creek. They've seen it for 20, you know, 
12 years. And so I'm like, where, where is this coming from? Well, we tracked it down, and it's actually coming from a little housing development behind the school that obviously if you're, you know, uh, emptying your oil down the drain in your neighborhood, it's going to end up in the creek. So obviously you can use their, they could use their photographs for ID, you know, what plan is this? I tend to let kids come up with those questions themselves. If they want to, um, oh, here I found my seventh and eighth grade pictures. I think what's so neat is, of course, being seventh and eighth graders quickly, the kids decided certain kids were the best, you know, photographers, and then they would all go and imitate, you know, and take pictures like them. And sometimes I would put together some of their slides and we have quick discussions like this. Um, and just building on, um, and you know, they're experimenters. It, w it was a lot of fun to work with them. Oh, that's a picture I put in. Uh, actually, I just threw it in for the fun of it. This was a, um, a deer skeleton that I found in the woods, and it was still articulated. You can see the connective tissue. It's still there. It's been up there two years. So I, I went home and got some reef wire, and I hung it. <laughs> and uh, it's been outside. It's just, boy, it shows you the toughness of tendon material, but it's been out there through two, two uh, winters. Oh, that I've heard about. Somebody's mentioning youth voices. I know. I, I've heard about that. I've actually visited it uh, once on it. And um, so that's cool. I don't know if people have um, questions. I see we're kind of uh, getting close to the end. Or if you want me to go back over anything. I, I, I'd say the one thing I love about this project is it doesn't need to take a lot of time. It doesn't need to cost a lot of money. And it's definitely a place where kids can become agents of the learning. And we all learn. Um, the, I didn't teach, uh, I see the question here about editing. Yes, definitely um, the older kids edit their photos. With the little kids, no. Um, we don't. Um, I, you know, if I had a child, sometimes I mean, you'll have a, a, a student who's really into that. And actually, I work with somebody now um, who he's now in high school, but he he so quickly surpassed me in terms of uh, video editing that I had to turn it all over to him. And the other thing I think that's great as a teacher starting oh, so, oh one last thing I do want to I will just throw out if somebody doesn't have a question. Do you teach specific therapy skills like picture framing, getting close up thirds, et cetera? Um, seventh and eighth grade, yes. You know, um, and a lot of times uh, there are a number of sites where you can go and see that stuff. I would throw it out to them, and they were interested in that. With the real little kids, no. What we do do, though, sometimes is put up two pictures and have them, which, which, which do you think is the best picture? Why do you think it's the best picture? And then they will often discover, you know, what it is. But I was going to say the thing that was so bad, one thing that's so valuable for me, I think you take kids outdoors, and if you are doing anything connected to science or whatever, this is not our environment. You know, it's not like controlled little science room where everything that's out I have control over. They're going to ask questions about which I have no answers. And it's, you know, that was one of the hardest things I learned as a teacher when I was young. Um, I, I went to a conference once, and there were students at the conference too, and the uh, physics was in my background, but the guy put out a physics question, and we had to write the answers down. I wrote down the wrong answer, and I was mortified because, you know, here I was, I'm supposed to know everything. And I came to realize I actually took my wrong answer and put it in my bulletin board in my room because um, I realized that it's really a great thing to learn. Boy, I don't know. How can you find out? So I don't know if that's kind of the end of things. I really want to appreciate um, people for their questions and their enthusiasm. And please email me. And if you are interested in sharing voice threads with uh, your students, um, that would be great. Uh, that was absolutely wonderful. Robin, does anyone have any questions before we uh, 
finished this session. And while you're there, we were going to do this at the start, but we didn't do it. If you'd like to just show us whereabouts in the world you're from, then we get an idea of where we're talking to. That was an absolutely wonderful session, uh, Robin. It's really brought home all that. Um, it highlighted what young children are capable of, and this is what I find fascinating. I work in adult education, so I love seeing the changes and what's being introduced to uh, young children. So thank you very much. It was a very good session, and we all enjoyed it. So I think a little hands up for Robin, a little applause, um, just a the little icons there will give you a hands up the Aussie series way. Thank you very much. And I really want to thank um, you, Manita, um, um, for coming, stepping up, helping me out, talking to me when I first signed up for this. Because I've, I've done a lot of online, or, you know, in face presentations. I've never done one of these. And at the very beginning when I was accepted, I thought, oh my gosh. And you were so helpful and supportive. So I really, really appreciate that. And I give you my uh, applause. Thank you very my much. <laughs> uh, if everyone wants to move on now, and please don't forget to keep, um, you've got to email, uh, Robin's email address if you want to know a little bit more. I'm sure she won't mind if we get in touch with her. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Oh.